This is the first week of ENM 2020. I've already given you a bit of an introduction to the course, and you've already now heard a first lecture from Jorge Soberon about ecological niche theory. In this talk, I'm going to give you a bit of a, uh, a reflection on maybe a broader topic that we could call distributional ecology. That is to say, I want to talk about kind of this, this old and new uh, area of inquiry that we could call distributional ecology. The question of why is a species where it is and why is a species not where it's not. So let's, let's go in and, and take a look at some things. Um, so again, again, I want to I wanna talk about this question of why is a species where it is and why is a species not where it's not. And really, I think we can go back to a, 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 about a century to Joseph Grinnell, who's shown in this picture, um, and I think it's a fair assertion that he started this, this science of distributional ecology. Of course, it's had a, a renaissance uh, in the last couple of decades, but let's, let's give Grinnell a lot of credit. Now, Grinnell was based at Berkeley, at the Museum of, of Vertebrate Zoology, which he, which he helped to found. Um, and Grinnell got very interested in the biota of California, uh, and essentially what he did was he started exploring the limits of species distributions. So a century ago, and I'll, I'll make this, um, this paper available to you, a century ago he, he uh, publishes this paper called The Niche Relationships of the California Thrasher. And you can see the, the, um, the map that he published in that paper where he has um, black dots showing known occurrences, and then a hashed area that, uh, that shows an approximate range for the species. Another early paper, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about these two together because he does pretty much the same thing, but another early paper was called Field Tests of Theories Concerning Distributional Control. And He's talking about a, a J that's a, a high elevation J and gives us the example of uh, that in California, the species does not b descend below a certain altitude. Now, three factors in its distribution are connected with altitude, barometric pressure, atmospheric density, and temperature. And he goes on to give kind of an interesting geographic test where he points out that in Northern California, this species goes almost all the way down to sea level. And so the factors of, of atmospheric pressure, barometric pressure, and air density are eliminated, um, and that focuses, focuses us on temperature. And uh, Grinnell went on to provide us with this nice list of factors vegetation, rainfall, wetness or dryness of the soil, um, all sorts of features of the natural environment. Now, almost all of this list is kind of physical features of the environment, but a couple at the end, notice he includes interspecific pressure or competition, and he includes parasitism. And so that, that clouds the picture just a bit, but Let's, let's suffice it to say that Grinnell's emphasis was on uh, physical features of the environment and not so much on interactions with other species. Now things got really messy really quickly because just 10, 13, 10 to 13 years after Grinnell's publications, Sir Charles Elton comes along and recycles this word niche to mean the place of a species in the biotic environment, which is to say its relationship to, to food and enemies. And this mixes the idea of requirements of the species with the role of the species in a community. So it's the same word, but it's given multiple and very different meanings, which is probably a bad idea. 
Now, just so you see that this whole idea of niche modeling, which is the focus of this course, is not new. I want you to see a publication from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, I think it was from the 1940s. I may be wrong about that. But what I want you to see is this map. Areas in the southern United States with climate rather similar to Red Jungle Fowl Range in India. And notice he has this area in the extreme southeast that is excellent. He has this intermediate area that is fair. And then this shaded area, which is called borderline. And this is a lot like we do in ecological niche modeling, except it's done by hand and by intuition and probably just by reference to weather station data, but no quantitative tools. So another early route, um, we can talk about this man, Arturo Gomez Pompa, um, and the large group of people with whom he worked in Veracruz. Um, this is way back in, in the quantitative era of, um, of data analysis and biology. For those of you who haven't seen one of these, this thing here is a punch card. And in fact, early in my career, we used these. But you can see there are 80 characters across the face of the punch card. And when you wanted to use a particular character, you just punched out that little rectangle like you can see there. Um, and essentially, this was a way of feeding into uh, a machine that could read um, analog data and turn them into digital one character at a time in lines that were 80 characters or less. And Gomez Pompa and his group um, again laid out a list of, var of uh, variables that were physical in nature. You know, climate, precipitation, temperature, uh, elevation, um, number of days with clouds, number of days with hail, number of clear days, etc. So again, we're focused back on the Grinnellian set of variables. And um, Gomez Pompa, and especially his, his um, fellow researcher, Margarita Soto, um, produced a series of, of very early publications. You can see their, their GIS was um, prim pretty primitive looking to our eyes. Um, but essentially what they did was they created very simple ecological niche models and then predicted distributions of species. There's another early image, sorry about the quality of it, but an early image of um, the area that fits the, um, the environmental intervals that had been inferred for a particular species. Okay, <coughs> so I'd like to now kind of come up to the present and give you all just a, a bit of a, an example of um, what sorts of questions and what sorts of problems we're going to encounter in this field of niche modeling. This is a very, very rare bird. It's called Tijuca atra. Um, it was dis described in 1829. Um, this is the, the, the front cover of the, uh, the publication where it, was, where it was described. And here's the entire description. Those of you who have written species descriptions know that it's not this easy anymore. Um, but what this says is um, Tejuka Atra gives the name refers to a plate, you can see PL12. It then says a new genus of bird, and it then describes to us the type species, and it basically says it's, uh, it's a blackbird with, with um, yellow in the wings. Remember, we're talking about distributional ecology, so I'll call your attention to this 
clause um, where it says Tijuka Atra, the black Tijuka, comes from the interior of Brazil. Okay, how's that? That looks to me like interior Brazil. Well, let's hit the internet. We have the the blessing of a, a modern communication system. Let's hit the internet and see what we find. <clears throat> That's the map that we find online uh, from the infamous IUCN range polygons. And I guess if you consider that most people were arriving to Brazil in Rio de Janeiro, then Tijuca Atra, I guess, was from interior Brazil because you had to go into the mountains up from Rio de Janeiro. So, okay, interior Brazil is not this, but rather this. Let's keep going. This is a pretty small range. If you think about it, it's this tiny little sliver right there. So that's a pretty range-restricted species, but let's, let's go farther. There we are with our, our tiny polygon shown in red. Um, on the surface of Brazil. But let's zoom in, okay? And we see, yeah, it's, it's a, a very small range. But let's, let's get some distributional data. And where most bird watchers go to see this species is the Itatiaia National Park. And so you can see we have a fair number of records. We have one that's a little bit weird. We need to think about that. And you'll see in, 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 the, uh, in this course, we're going to talk a fair amount about data quality. And we need to ask, you know, is this maybe an old record that used to be in forest? Or is this a new record, uh, maybe of an extra limital bird? Or maybe it's an error. We need to think about those things. I, I don't know the answer right now. Here's the whole distribution of the species. Here's Rio de Janeiro. And you, here's that IUCN polygon that looked so small when we were looking at that part of the Earth. And what you can see is it's just three or four areas where this species has been recorded. All of this is within the IUCN polygon. But you can see some big areas that don't seem to hold records. So that's another thing we need to think about. And so this example, and we'll come back to this example, but this example is designed to illustrate for you challenges in distributional ecology. Certainly, we have pervasively an incomplete knowledge of species distributions, and some people have called this the Wallacean shortfall. We have scale dependency of all range maps. We have potential for errors and inconsistencies in data. And we have associations between occurrence of our species and features of the environment and features of the landscape. So let's do some basic concepts. Some of these will overlap or even repeat what Jorge Soberon just, just told you about, but the repetition is there and this is from a, from a slightly different perspective. So we can create maps of environmental conditions very easily. Um, we have data sets like WorldClim and Chelsea, and you're gonna hear a lot about those in, the, in, in this course. This is a geographic representation of those environmental variables. So we can also overlay points across geographic space this is, I think, 5,000 or 10,000 random points overlaid on terrestrial areas of the world. And then we can, from that, create a graphic of the relationship between annual precipitation and annual temperature or any pair of environmental variables. We can look at their relationships. And there are a bunch of neat things about these, these graphics. Notice that they can have long arms they can have high density areas and low density areas. Okay, these are very strange 
distributions and strange environmental spaces. And we have to remember that because that will determine how we can do our analyses. And so Jorge Soberon told you about this Hutchinsonian duality, but it's essentially the idea that our species, wherever it's distributed, is distributed simultaneously in geographic space and in environmental space. And we have to remember that duality always, or we will make dumb mistakes. So he also talked with you about distributional areas, and I'm going to just remind you of the BAM diagram. We have some geographic area of interest, which we can call G. Within that, some geographic area meets the Grinnellian niche requirements, the physiological requirements of our species. I'm going to remind you, this is a map. This is a view in geographic space. So this is north-south and this is east-west. Now, those, that abiotically suitable area that we termed A overlaps to some degree with the region that would be favorably in bio, favor, favorable in biotic terms as well. We can call that B. Okay, and this might be the area that lacks certain pathogens or holds certain prey items or mutualists or symbionts. And so this area of overlap is a very important area because that's where the conditions are right abiotically and biotically. Um, so that area, we could call it a potential distribution of our species because that's where all the conditions are right. And then we're going to bring in a third consideration, which is which areas are accessible to our species. And so now we have... B for biotic, A for abiotic, and M for mobility or movement. And we should be thinking that this three-way overlap, this, this area that meets all three of these criteria, is the occupied distributional area of our species. Now, obviously, the species isn't in every square centimeter of that area for a variety of reasons, but that's the area that our species can survive in, in the long term, and has access to, okay? This other half of the, of the potential distribution is the invadable area. That's the place that is not currently accessible, but is suitable for our species. Now, that's the usual configuration of BAM. And please remember, the BAM diagram is a heuristic. It's just there to teach us. And also, please remember that the BAM diagram is in geographic space. So drawing these things as circles is silly. But we're going to keep doing it because this is a heuristic. That doesn't mean that we always have this sort of kind of even overlap that looks like the, the Olympic symbol. We might have something very different. Like here's a BAM uh, configuration where everything is accessible, but the abiotic and biotic have that same reduced overlap area. And we can, just for fun, we can call this the Hutchinsonian configuration of the world because G. Evelyn Hutchinson, who was another very important early voice in distributional ecology, Hutchinson kind of neglected the accessibility, the M consideration. And he really talked only about the abiotic and the biotic. And so you all have heard about the fundamental and realized niches, which are in environmental space, not in geographic space, but they're kind of the corresponding quantities to the abiotic and biotic um, areas in geographic space. Now, that's only one alternative configuration. Uh, this guy is Alfred Russell Wallace, or was, I guess. He's, he's no longer alive. And Wallace uh, might have thought this about Hutchinson if they had lived in the same century. Uh, Wallace... <coughs> 
traveled a lot. In fact, he did a very fascinating uh, circumnavigation of the world. And here you can see in these red lines, here are his travels in the in Southeast Asia and and uh, the, the the Malaysian area. And what you can see is he spent a lot of time in between these regions. Here's Borneo and Java and Sumatra and you know the Philippines and Sulawesi and all that. And to this day we remember his contribution as Wallace's line, where he pointed out that right through here, faunas and floras changed massively. And that was, that was all about access and mobility. So Wallace's view of the world might be very different. He might think, or he might have thought, that the abiotic and the biotic are kind of unimportant and that the real important constraint was access because he, he went to regions of the world where access was really big. I mean, really, it was a really important constraint on, on distributions of species. So we could call that, in contrast to Hutchinson's world, we could call that Wallace's world. And we'll come back to these points. And then another possibility that uh, a bunch of us pointed out in 2011 in a, in a book that, that we'll be referring to in this course. Uh, we also pointed out that sometimes biotic interactions may not be so important. And so those biotic interactions, the green circle, may not be a very limiting constraint, and all of the action may be between the abiotic and accessibility. And here are three configurations of that. So we could call that, again, we'll come back to this, but we'll, we can come back to the Eltonian noise hypothesis and to basically say that that's the idea that maybe biotic interactions are not very important in limiting geographic scale, not local scale, geographic scale distributions of species. Now, if we go over to the other half of the Hutchinsonian duality, we're going to start talking about ecological niches. Essentially, the A circle, the, the uh, abiotic uh, suitable area in the BAM diagram is analogous to this thing that we're going to call the fundamental ecological niche. Okay, and the fundamental niche, again, Jorge's talked about this before, is this this uh, set of conditions where our species can maintain populations. Now I want to take you kind of into the real world, which is that the fundamental niche is greater than or equal to or, or is, is more inclusive than this second quantity that which we can call the existing fundamental niche. What is the existing fundamental niche? It's the fundamental niche intersected with the set of environments represented across M. So this eta operator means the set of environments in a geographic region. And so what we're saying about the existing fundamental niche is it's going to be smaller than or possibly equal to the fundamental niche, but it is the reduction of the fundamental by the set of environments that are accessible to the species. <coughs> and then there's a third niche idea, which is which we can call the realized ecological niche, which again is nested within the existing niche. And the realized niche is the reduction of the existing by the set of environments represented across the biotically suitable area. Okay, so that, this, this is a complex equation. I hope that I've explained it to you reasonably well, but this is really crucial because we're gonna talk a lot about this inequality, that the existing niche is a subset generally of the fundamental niche, and for that reason is uh, not representative of the, of the full fundamental niche.
Now, a final point is that if the Eltonian noise hypothesis holds, we really can ignore this, this last inequality. Why? Because the environments associated with B are large and are indeed larger than all of these other terms. And so this last constraint intersect with the environments associated with B that constraint doesn't reduce the realized niche from the existing niche at all. So we end up with this inequality, or this, this equality, where we see that the existing fundamental niche is the reduction of the fundamental niche by the set of environments that are available to the species across its accessible area. This is a really crucial um, equation because it can teach us a lot about things. I'll give you one example. <clears throat> we might have an invasive species with two distributional areas. The, the uh, example that I'm referring to is a centauri, it's an invasive plant. It's native to Europe and actually Asia as well, although we only have data, good data, good detailed data for for Europe, and then it has an invasive area in the western United States. And the interesting thing is if you look at just the environmental qualities of this area of Europe and this area of the western, of western North America, nothing about where the species is. So this is just the environmental characteristics of the two accessible areas we end up with this. This is precipitation on the vertical axis, annual temperature on the horizontal axis. And let's just imagine that this might be a species niche, Centauria or other. But what I want you to see is that that niche has very different characteristics in the two distributional areas. Even if it's the same ellipsoid, its centroid in Europe would be up here, and its centroid in North America would be down here. Why is that? Well, it was very simple. North America has deserts. Europe doesn't. North America has tropical rainforest areas, or at least subtropical areas if you go into southern Texas and southern Florida. Europe doesn't have that. Again, these are different environmental characteristics of the two accessible areas, and that makes the realized niche, the part of the fundamental niche that is observable, that makes the realized niche have very different characteristics. And so we see in that example, the realized niche is very different from the fundamental niche because of this intersection, this reduction. So as another um, implication of the, this inequality, imagine we want to ask the question of whether two fundamental niches are the same. Well, the only way to ask that question is to take into account the environments associated with um, the accessible areas of those two species, which is to say only if we condition our comparison of the fundamental niches on what's available can we make this comparison cogently. Let me restate. The only part of the fundamental niche that is observable is the realized niche. Anything beyond the realized niche is just a guess or an inference or an extrapolation. And so the only way to make the comparison of two realized niches is by taking into account the background, essentially the set of environments accessible to those two uh, populations or species. If we don't do that, we're going to be comparing two realized niches 
and we may be fooled by differences in the environments accessible to the two populations or species. This sounds obvious, maybe, but it's a mistake that's been made dozens of times in the literature, and it's led to seriously wrong conclusions about, um, about the biology of, of species and about the liability, the, the plasticity of ecological niches through time. Okay, so we're coming down to the end of this. Uh, I just want to go back to our original example, the, the Tijuca example. I want to kind of wrap up this view of what can we learn from studies of distributional ecology. And I want to give you a flowchart of the whole process, which we're now going to spend six months reviewing and overviewing and thinking about and discussing. So <coughs> within some hypothesis of the accessible area for Tijuca, the accessible area and its environments are shown as the blue dots and the orange dots, but the places where Tijuca has been found are shown as the orange dots. And I think what you can see is that there's a fair concentration down here and not up here in this environmental space. This is an environmental space defined on the principal components axes. It doesn't matter. It's an environmental space. And so we're going to use some niche modeling algorithm. I'm not going to go into the details of which. It doesn't matter. But we're going to identify a sector of environmental space that seems to be within the niche of Tijuca. And we're going to leave out the rest of environmental space. And notice that we're leaving out some of our occurrences, and those would be hypothesized either to be errors or to be extra limitals, dispersers, something like that. For a species like Tijuca, they're probably just errors. But let's look at what just this very simple niche model can tell us about the distributional ecology of this species. So we're going to cross the Hutchinsonian duality and go over to geographic space. There's our original IUCN polygon and our points. And here's what we get. Within that ellipsoid, that, that hypothesis of an elite ecological niche, we have these blue area, sorry, these red areas. And outside of that niche model, we have these blue areas. And notice what this is suggesting to us. It's suggesting to us that our distribution of our species is actually really tiny, and that the IUCN polygon is a ridiculously coarse view of what is actually a very, very small uh, restricted range of a species. And so what do we learn? We learn that we have a huge gap within the distribution of our species we have some hypotheses of erroneous points, and we have some hypotheses of areas that are not accessible. For that reason, they're not inhabited, but they may be otherwise suitable for the species. So just by this simple and almost silly little exercise, we've learned some really interesting lessons. So now we can go from these examples and these comments to kind of a, a methodological overview. <clears throat> this is my view of the process. This is not necessarily the view that my colleagues and the other instructors in this course might have. But I wanted to share this with you just because it gives you kind of an overview of the broad parts of the process. Here at the one beginning, we're going to assemble a bio. A, an occurrence data set, and at another beginning point, we're going to assemble environmental data. We're going to take some intermediate processing steps, but really the next big process or step is this idea of estimating M, estimating the area that is accessible to the species 
and also understanding what is the configuration of BAM for our species in, in particular. Once we have all of those four things assembled, the data and these two sets of hypotheses, we can estimate our ecological niche, and that can be a pretty seriously complex endeavor now. We can, once we estimate our niche, cross over into geographic space and carry out some steps of model evaluation. And then all of this sector is about interpretation of what our model tells us. And so again, this is just an overview, and I've taken the liberty of, of adding a bunch of um, citations that would go with many of these steps. And so you can check those out when you have time. Okay, so between Jorge Soberon and me in our lectures uh, for this first week, we've outlined a bunch of key concepts. We've talked about ecological niches of species and geographic distributions of species. For ecological niches, we have a whole bunch of concepts going from the fundamental, the existing, and the realized niches to the environmental characteristics of known occurrences and the environmental characteristics of the, the area that's been sampled or explored by the species, M. And also we, we can look under geographic distributions at potential and actual distributions. Uh, the known distribution might be where we have actual occurrence points and the invadable distribution. My point in this slide is simply Notice that you don't just say the ecological niche of this species is this, or the geographic distribution of the species is this. Rather, each of these things, the ecological niche and the geographic distribution, each one is a pretty seriously complex set of concepts. And you really need to master those concepts and master the terminology to be able to to communicate effectively in this field of distributional ecology. So why do we use ecological niche modeling? Well, we're going to use it to estimate actual distributions. We're going to use it to understand dimensions of the fundamental niche. We may want to predict the distributional potential in other regions or at other times. And we may be a we may be wishing to understand more deeply what factors have shaped the geographic distributions of a species or a lineage in terms of abiotic, biotic uh, requirements, and also uh, limitations to dispersal. So this is intended just as, a, as an introduction to this area of endeavor that we can call distributional ecology. Uh, I hope that this has been informative to you. Um, I think you may, or some people, may see these conceptual ideas and these, these discussions with strange-looking set-based equations as, as uh, pedantic or not, not useful. Um, my experience is that if you get the concepts right, <clears throat> you're going to do a better job with the modeling. And so I would urge each of you to take this seriously, get the concepts right, use appropriate terminology, and build your arguments about the distributional ecology of a particular species or whatever your research question is. Build those arguments in a solid and appropriate conceptual uh, framework. Well, that ends uh, week one of this course. I hope that this has been a good kickoff for you. Um, there's an email address in the next slide after I stop talking. And I hope that if you have questions or concerns, go ahead and write us. And we will get to your questions as we are able. Um, and 
please be patient with the whole group of instructors. Um, we've got every intention of doing this right and doing this well. Um, and I hope that this course will be useful to you.